So uh, if you have a finitely generated field and a smooth projective variety, or K, then uh, there's the conjecture by Rotenberg and Serre that the action of the, the absolute Galois group of K on the Eladic cohomology of uh, X is semi-simple. Uh, I'm not going to prove it, <laughs> but I'm going to uh, do comments about it. Uh, um, I think it happens to a few of us to uh, take one of these uh, big conjectures and uh, to try our hand at them and, and fail. <laughs> but uh, I mean, if we don't try, uh, then we'll never know the answer. So that's just some small attempt to, to do something. Uh, so uh, here are some cases when, uh, I mean, some reductions. First, it's stable under products. Then you can enlarge the ground field as much as you want, as long as you do finite extensions. Then uh, in uh, common shield degree one, it's true because of the theorems on abelian varieties. Uh, uh, it's also true for K3 surfaces over a finite and number of fields. And then uh, there's a theorem of Delin that it's true, uh, so-called geometrically in characteristic P. That means uh, the part, there's some, something to press. I mean, okay, this part of the Galois group acts semi-simply. This is a theorem. And it implies that at least in characteristic P, the conjecture reduces to uh, the case of uh, smooth projective varieties over F FP. So, and then uh, there's a further reduction to the cohomology of uh, vanishing cycles for Lefschet pencil, which follows the reduction of uh, Delin in, uh, in V1 to prove the V conjecture. So that was. Uh, that was observed in a slightly different way by Leifu a long time ago. <coughs> Leifu should not be confused with Liefu, for those who know him. Uh, and so I'll try to, to run through the, the argument. <coughs> Let's see if I get, get it right. So first, we can always enlarge the ground field. I already said that. So then, uh, uh, it's an induction on the dimension of the variety. So the first point is that uh, the really uh, fleshy case is the middle, uh, middle dimension, because the rest you, you reduce to smaller dimensional varieties by weak left sheds and Poincaré duality. Then uh, we would like x to be uh, even dimensional for using left sheds pencils. And then we can do that, because there's a theorem of Serre which says that if you have two semi-simple, I mean two uh, rep Galois representations whose tensor product is semi-simple, then uh, each of them is semi-simple. So we can take uh, cohomology of uh, x, hd of x, tensor square is a direct sum of HD, h2d of x square. So now the induction will be on uh, di the dimension which is assumed to be even concerns hd of x. So now I need to review uh, Lefschetz pencil. So uh, Lefschetz pencil is a vibration of a variety which is as nice uh, as it can be. So I start from my even dimensional smooth projective variety x and uh, put it in a projective space and then uh, I take a linear subspace A of co-dimension 2 in P, and then you think of hyperplanes uh, containing A, and you think of them as running around A. That's, that's the pencil. And then uh, you intersect this pencil with, uh, with X, and you get a pencil of hyperplane sections associated to A. And if you like to parameterize it, the best is to use the dual line d in the dual projective space. And then uh, with this, you get an incidence variety, uh, this x tilde, which projects onto d and also onto x, uh, such that the inverse image of a point in d is uh, the hyperplane section. 
So this is, this is a projection. And then we see that it's a left shed pencil when f is uh, as little singular as possible. So what does it mean? Well, uh, first, maybe I'll draw it. So we had uh, x is my original variety, x tilde, and then d, uh, f, and phi. So then, then left shed pencil means that uh, the axis A is transverse to X. So then uh, the intersection will be a smooth subvariety of co-dimension 2, delta. And uh, then one can show that X tilde is the blow-up of X as at delta, so it's smooth. And also F is geometrically con connected. Uh, second condition is that uh, there are only isolated uh, singular points over a finite subset the, uh, in, uh, in X tilde, and they lie so over a finite subset uh, S of D. Uh, and the last condition is that these singular points are as mild as possible. So ordinary singular quadratic points, that means uh, nodes, if you are away from characteristic 2. Uh, and then uh, the existence of left shed pencil is not uh, completely trivial. So in characteristic uh, zero, uh, there's always a left shed pencil. And in characteristic, uh, in positive characteristic, it's almost true. But you might have to enlarge the projective embedding a little bit by taking, uh, instead of hyperplane sections, uh, hypersurface sections of degree uh, at least two. And then and they exist. Uh, so uh, on top of that, we can uh, make uh, extra assumptions. An extra assumption, which is, so in SGA7, it's called condition A. And I'm going to explain this condition A uh, later. So this is a condition which implies that the vanishing cycles are non-zero. And it will always happen if you take a large enough Veronese uh, embedding. Uh, so let me assume that we are in this case. We can start to uh, run the machine of uh, uh, vanishing cycles of the Lepschitz pencil. So first, uh, the cohomology of x is a direct sum of the cohomology of x tilde. So to prove some simplicity, it's sufficient to prove it for x tilde. Then uh, the main point is that the Lorentz spectral sequence for f degenerates uh, because of, of, the, of the hard left shed's theorem and also condition A. And unfortunately, the hard left shed's theorem depends on uh, V2 in characteristic P. So, uh, but still, it's this, uh, if F were a smooth projective, this would be Deligne's argument for the degeneration of this kind of spectral sequence. And it's not, it's not quite smooth, but it, uh, it still works. So spectral se sequence degenerates. So uh, to prove some simplicity, it's sufficient to prove it on the E2 term, E2PQ for P plus Q equals T. And then uh, the base has dimension 1, so there is uh, just uh, P equals 0, 1, 2. No. Yes? Uh, degenerate means that uh, the abutment is the direct sum of the in that sense. <coughs> so these are, uh, are easy to handle because they reduce to uh, the cohomology. So you take, you take one, uh, one smooth fiber of F, and inside you take a hyperplane section. So the dimension has gone down from D to D minus 2. It's still even. And then, uh, so we can apply the induction. So the crucial, ca crucial case is E two, one, d minus one. So it's, I think it's exactly the same reduction as in uh, V1. Uh, and then I have to explain this E1, uh, d, uh, E2, one, d minus one. So uh, that's where vanishing cycles appear. So uh, U is d minus S, so S is this uh, 
set of exceptional points and uh, to each such point one can associate a so-called vanishing cycle delta s in the cohomology of a good fiber of a smooth fiber which is well defined up to sine and then uh, since uh, the total space has even dimension, the action of the inertia on, uh, on the cohomology is given by uh, the picard lefschetz formula, which, is, which looks like this. It's uh, equation two on the, on the board. Uh, and then uh, we have extra information uh, like, uh, like this that I'm not really going to use. Uh, but these uh, plus or minus delta s are conjugate under the action of pi. Then uh, one can compute the cohomology of a singular fiber at s in terms of the generic fiber and this intersection product. Then, uh, so the most important is this E, which is uh, the subspace generated by the vanishing cycles. And then, uh, so it's uh, it's orthogonal for the intersection pairing is just the fixed points of the uh, geometric van der Venzel group. Uh, something I'm going to use since I've already used ha hard left sheds, I'm also going to use, it implies that uh, E is non-degenerate for this uh, intersection pairing. This is implied by uh, hard left sheds. Then the action of pi, pi was uh, the geometric fundamental group of U, which is when you remove the uh, exceptional points. So the action of U of pi on E is absolutely irredu irreducible. And then, unfortunately, I'm not going to use this, but it's a very nice result. The action of uh, the image of the monodromy in uh, the symplectic group of E is, is open. That's the kajdan margulis theorem. So, and then we have this uh, property, which is the definition of condition A, which is that this sheaf uh, Rn, so N was uh, the, um, I guess N should be uh, D minus one. Hmm? It's true for all of them, but the, the important one should be, uh, it should be Rd minus one, yes, yeah. So it's the same as uh, J is, this openly Martian here. Right. So then uh, we get that, yes, this, is, this n is wrong here. Uh, this, uh, it's rd minus one uh, f lower star ql is j lower star e, the, uh, this n is strange. Well, I don't know. But anyway, you get that the, the important E2 term is H1 of uh, D bar. D bar means of the uh, algebraic closure uh, with value in uh, J lower star E where E is the vanishing cycles. So that's the one we want to study. Uh, so uh, I haven't said anything uh, which, which you don't know yet. So then uh, what I would like to do is to describe this H1 of D bar, J lower star E. And so uh, to do that, I want to understand it in terms of group cohomology, because group cohomology is something, uh, at least for me, concrete that uh, I can handle with co-cycles and uh, do computations with. So uh, the action of pi, which was uh, the pi as pi one of d bar of u, <coughs> the geometric fundamental group, factors through the tame fundamental group, which is the quotient of pi by the images of wild inertias at uh, points of s, so that the corresponding tame inertia is it's not quite z hat of one, but it's uh, 
away from it like that. And then uh, it's not hard to show that you can compute, you can replace this h1 of u bar e by, by h1 of pi t e, and this h1 of i s e by uh, these. And so now I'm going to use the structure of pi t. So it's not quite a free profinite group because these i, I s t are not uh, quite uh, free, yeah. but it's as free as possible. So it means uh, it's presented by generators of these i s, and the only relation is uh, this relation, gamma 1, gamma r equals 1. Okay, and then using this, I can give you a description of uh, this H1 of d bar j low star e. So that's the first thing. There's an exact sequence. No, sorry. There's a complex, which is written on the board, such that uh, H1 of d bar j low star e is the middle homology of this complex. So this complex is important, so I'm going to to write it here, it's uh, zero e and here you have a uh, you have this group that we are interested in. Uh, and there are some maps, alpha, sigma tilde, which are completely explicit. So alpha sends uh, an element of E on something which involves the uh, intersection product. And so that, that was the... Uh, how do you say, uh, the inertia character, it's uh, given by the action on uh, roots of the uniformizing, local uh, uniformizing parameter. And then this one is a kind of twisted sum, so here you really need to choose this order on the points of S. Uh, and then you get uh, this, uh, uh, this computation just by chasing in a, in, in a diagram. You write this uh, commutative diagram. It's a completely simple-minded uh, uh, computation. Uh, you see that this map is injective, so it's the snake lemma, which gives you the uh, computation. And uh, as a corollary, you see you, it gives something interesting. It gives that gives the dimension of this H1 as a cardinality of s minus two times dim e, which means that if you want this group to be, uh, this uh, vector space to be non-zero, then uh, you need S to be quite large, because E will be at least two-dimensional. It uh, carries a, a symplectic uh, form. Uh, and so if you want this to be at least one-dimensional, S has to have five points, at least. So that's uh, something I was surprised when I... I realized that. Uh, Doesn't S usually decide that S doesn't When you increase the size of S? Mm. I mean, they, they ease the space span by the vanishing point. That's right. So the more points you have, you have the more vanishing point. It's not clear, because there are relations between them. Yeah, there are them. relations. <laughs> so it's, it's the opposite way. The more E is big, mm, the more S is big. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's something uh, not too bad. But after all, we are look, we are look, we are after the Galois action on this. So that would be the next step, which is uh, to have an action of pi one of u. So that's the arithmetic uh, uh, fundamental group on this exact sequence. And so that's a basic question. Uh, if you come back to the construction, I used uh, one co-cycles and one co-boundaries. So if I have a 
profinite group G and which acts on uh, G module E. Is there a G action? Is there a natural G action of, uh, on uh, the one co cycles? And I would also need, if H is a normal subgroup of G, I would also like an action of G on this H1 of H E, Z1 of H T E. And uh, the answer is, uh, is yes. Uh, it's not really difficult. That's because you can, you can view Z1 of G E as uh, G homomorphisms from the augmentation ideal of G to E. And then this I G is a, a bimodule. It has a left and a right action. So once you have taken this, these G homomorphisms, you keep an action on, uh, on the other side. And that's, that's uh, how you get this reaction. So more precisely, you can look at this exact sequence of uh, uh, G bimodules, the augmentation exact sequence. And then you get an X exact sequence. And it's just your usual uh, exact sequence of H1 presented as uh, co-cycles modulo co-boundaries. And using this, you can uh, compute the action. And what you get is the action of an element of G on a one co-cycle is given by this formula. So a crossed homomorphism, that's, that's why they were in the title. Uh, so then when you compute this, you get uh, something a little nicer. It's not very surprising, because this eta uh, sorry, eta was the map which sends uh, an element of E to the co-boundary. And we know that G in any, any way acts trivially on, on H1 of G E. I'm trying to uh, get something here. Uh, so of course, uh, G F modulo co-boundary should be F. And that's the explicit formula. So then, if I take a normal subgroup of G, then uh, I, will, I will get an action on uh, Z1 of H E just by uh, applying this formula. But of course, this is not going to be true anymore. OK, so uh, this is not quite sufficient to compute yet, because uh, you see, if we come back to this uh, diagram. I told you, I can, I can put a, a Galois action on this Z1. But what about this one? It's a dark sum of Z1 on, of inertia groups. How on earth can I get a, a Galois action on it? So that's the next step. And see, that's what I wrote. How can G act on the dark sum of the Z1 of inertias? And here there is a trick. Which is, if you take, if you add one generator, generator to your full finite group, uh, so now pi t tilde is the free, free pro finite or almost pro finite group with the, these generators gamma one, gamma r, but no relation. Then uh, we have a canonical isomorphism like that, and then I can interpret this pi tilde pi t tilde as a geometric pi 1 by just removing uh, some rational point from my curve uh, u here. So uh, using this, uh, if I do that, then the, the map, vertical map I had in uh, 5 is just corresponds to removing this. Uh, uh, it's probably in the opposite direction, sorry. Um, like this. So this is this corresponds to u. No, that's correct. This corresponds to u, and this corresponds to removing this extra uh, rational point. So in this way, we get a uh, natural Gal Galois action on the diagram, and therefore an action on uh, this complex. And so at least. Uh, I can give you an explicit formula for the, the action of the, uh, for the geometric Galois action on this complex. That's the first step. Uh, so what we find is that the action of pi t on this complex, 
So here it's the natural uh, action. Here it's given by this uh, matrix, uh, gamma i acts by this uh, formula. And then on the last term, uh, I was surprised at first, but uh, this is the trivial action of uh, pi t. But in fact, it's not too surprising because when you look at the, the original diagram, oh, sorry. Uh, yes. <coughs> we know that there is no Galois action here and no, uh, no geometric Galois action either here or here. So uh, it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite necessary that there is no uh, no geometric Galois action on this quotient. And in fact, one can prove that there is uh, pi t at trivially already on a uh, co-kernel of alpha. So if you like, you can think of this group in which we are interested as an extension of E, uh, I mean, what do I mean? We could divide by, uh, by the co-kernel of alpha and it would be uh, just uh, the kernel of, of this map on which geometrically there is no uh, Galois action. So now I want to explain how to get to the arithmetic Galois action. So the situation is like this. Uh, Gamma is uh, the absolute Galois group of my base field. Then uh, I have my pi t, which is the uh, geometric uh, tame fundamental group. Then this goes for uh, u minus this uh, point. And then uh, here I take uh, arithmetic tame fundamental groups for u and uh, tilde, and this sits in uh, this diagram, so the vertical maps are uh, surjective. And uh, the group which acts on the complex, on this complex, is G tilde, it's the largest one. And what I want to do uh, by the end of the talk is to describe this action. <coughs> uh, but, uh, uh, yeah. So, there's one thing we know on the action of G or G tilde on, let's say, of G tilde and pi T tilde, which is that it acts nicely with respect to these generators gamma I because, uh, ah, secretly, I have made my field uh, K large enough so that the points of S uh, are all rational. And also this, uh, this extra point, uh, U0, is, uh, is rational. So because of that, we have this kind of action that uh, g gamma i, g minus uh, one, is some conjugate of gamma i to a power kappa of g, where kappa turns out to be the cyclotomic character. That's, uh, um, yes? Pi one is covariant, yes. So I want the group without relation to map to the group with the relation. So seems right, no? <coughs> yeah. On the top it's uh, one point less. It's That's horizontal is uh, it's geometric uh, pi one to the arithmetic pi one to uh, pi one of the ground field. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's okay. Oh, I mm. Okay, so we have these uh, these basic relations and these lambda i of g. So uh, this extra element gamma is just I take the product of the gamma one of the gamma i's in the right order, and I take the inverse. So that if 
If I take the product of all of them in the right order, I get one. That's one step further. Uh, and then, um, these elements, lambda i of g and lambda, uh, why is it uh, g tilde? I don't know. Uh, they are unique. They are almost unique uh, because uh, in, a, in this almost free group, gamma i is its own uh, centralizer or normalizer. So they are uh, well defined up to right multiplication by some power of gamma i here or gamma here. And so uh, I can normalize uh, lambda i of g so that its weight at i is zero. So weight means uh, uh, exactly what you think. Have uh, gamma t tilde, then I can go to gamma t tilde a billion, which is a product of, uh, let's say it's not z prime hat of 1 over s, uh, and then um, well, from i equals 1 uh, to r. zero to r to take care of, uh, no, i equals one to r. And then uh, wi is the ith projection. It's the weight of a word at gamma i. Uh, OK. Sorry? Yes, I use this extra point. And uh, actually, uh, it gives something fairly nice, uh, which is, so I don't, <laughs> uh, it's not a very good color. Uh, but uh, if I use the last one, this uh, lambda tilde, lambda of g tilde, or lambda tilde of g, <coughs> ah, this is unreadable. Uh, I take. Lambda of g tilde inverse g inverse. Uh, uh, that's the one I wrote. And then I go to g. So in here, this element only depends on the projection of g tilde in, uh, in gamma. And so it gives a, project, a section of the projection g to gamma, which was uh, here of this map. And uh, this section corresponds to the section given by the rational point uh, u0, u0 that I added. Mm. So uh, for the, the end of the computation, I need uh, this lemma, which is that if I, if I take an element in uh, g tilde, which is uh, in the decomposition group of, uh, of s, of si, if you like, then uh, maybe after a finite extension of k, it, uh, it will leave uh, the corresponding vanishing cycle invariant. And uh, it's morally true if, uh, if you think of the way the vanishing cycles are constructed, because in the end, uh, they are algebraic cycles on, a, on, a, on an affine quadric. And uh, the char groups of this affine quadric are so small that there is no room to move. So uh, should be. And <coughs> I tried to find a reference. I asked uh, Takeshi Saito, who said, uh, yes, it's true. And you can read it off a paper of Illusi. So this is a paper. Illusi uh, published in uh, uh, Japanese proceedings where he gives an algebraic proof of the picard lefschetz formula. Because the Lin's proof in SJ7 uh, is transcendental in uh, dimension, in even dimension. So uh, well, anyway, this is true. And then uh, with this lemma, one gets, uh, one will get the formula. But uh, at first, I have to talk about Fox derivatives. So Fox derivatives were defined by Fox. 
for uh, the group ring of a free group. And they were extended by uh, Anderson and Ihara to the profinite setting. So it works like this. <coughs> there, are, there are functions from uh, the group ring to itself, di, which uh, have these identities and which are either 1 or 0 on the generators, gamma i. And uh, such that one has a formula like this, an identity. I like to call it uh, Euler-Fox formula because when you think of uh, differential calculus, you have you have this formula: f is sum of di f over uh, dxi. Xi. That's Euler's formula. Eh? Degree. Degree of f. Like that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. But this is uh, this one is the non-commutative analog of that one for me. Uh, oh, S is the augmentation. Sorry, the augmentation. Uh, and to be honest, uh, Ihara's proof is pr uh, written for a genuine profinite group, so one would have to check that it's still correct for this uh, this group, which is not uh, absolutely profinite. Because the, of the p part in characteristic p, but I guess it's no problem. So this, uh, uh, the interest of these uh, Fox derivatives is that they help you to compute the value of a of a one co-cycle on an element of the of your group of or your group algebra. <coughs> I think uh, this g should be pi t tilde. So you get uh, you get a formula like that. So this is the universal case of this formula. Uh, yes, somehow, somehow the, the augmentation ideal and the map which maps gamma i to gamma i minus 1 is the universal one co-cycle. So you get this, and here is a uh, one theorem I don't know how to use, unfortunately, but it's very nice, so I'll write it. It's called the Blanchfield-Linden Blanchfield theorem. Take a normal uh, closed subgroup pi t tilde, and then uh, if you write pi for the projection to the quotient, then you can describe uh, n ab as a pi t tilde module explicitly with this exact sequence with these, uh, with these maps. And uh, the case I, I would like to, uh, to have in mind is uh, we have pi t tilde which goes to sp of e and I would like to take n equals kernel of this. But uh, I don't know how to use this, so I'm going to give you the formula. So here's the formula of the action of an element of G tilde on the cent central term of this uh, complex. It's given by a matrix, which is, uh, so here it's not too bad, it's uh, the cyclotomic character. This, there are too many deltas, but this is a Kronecker symbol. And then uh, here it becomes really bad because this is a Fox derivative of some thing which involves these lambda j of g. So, and this is the intersection pairing. So this element can also be written like this, but uh, 
That's all I can say. I cannot uh, uh, take any conclusion from this formula, so uh, I better stop here.